we've heard from two storytellers, from John Sutter, who is looking, peering into the future, um, who's a filmmaker, and takes a long form storytelling approach to this, and from Al Roker, and Al captures the day, the weather, and also through his specials and other things, the moment that, uh, that and the urgency that climate change presents. But what if you're actually trying to shape policy? What if you're trying to bring people together and change the way we're dealing with this so we can cope and survive? The hottest city in America, hottest big city in America is Phoenix, Arizona, and it's getting hotter. Last year, Phoenix had 145 days over 100 degrees. Um, you know, in some places in the desert, it was 110, 122, not too far. I mean, that's nuts. That's crazy temperature. Phoenix, the city, has a heat island effect going, which makes the city 10 to 15 degrees warmer than rural areas. And it's been getting worse over recent, in recent years. Mayor Kate Gallego, she has her hands full. And she's very dedicated to this, and, and she's fascinating. She's 39 years old. She majored in environmental studies. She grew up with asthma, so she was relating directly to her ability to breathe the air that we should be taking for granted. Now, we featured the mayor uh, and, and Planet Forward, as I mentioned, in this terrific new media partnership that we're also pursuing with WNET Public Television in New York and their Peril and Promise series. It's their digital portal focused on climate change. The mayor is trying to make Phoenix a heat-ready city. Take a look. How has heat in Phoenix changed over recent years? We keep setting new records related to heat. We are seeing an increase in the number of days above 100. Uh, we are seeing higher temperatures and, and more health impacts. So it's something that we think about frequently, particularly in long-term planning for areas such as our water supply. You've said that you want Phoenix to be the first heat-ready city. What's a heat ready city? We are trying to develop a model and a toolkit for how cities can respond to heat. We want to make sure we're doing what we can to prepare, to communicate about it, and to mitigate these very serious impacts. Well, there are some very specific things that you're doing, and I'd like to unpack those a little bit. So, one of them, is, which is really interesting, is this cool pavement project that you're trying. That's pretty cool, but <laughs> I don't think that's exactly what's intended in the name. What is it and, and how much of a difference would it make? We have seen significant increases in overnight temperatures. Uh, we're in an ecosystem that we refer to as the Sonoran Desert ecosystem, and we used to see uh, much more significant declines in temperatures overnight, but pavement and man-made materials are really holding in that heat. We're now paving the city with cool pavement and then monitoring the impacts on our community. And we've seen a significant noticeable decline in the temperatures, particularly those critical overnight temperatures in the areas where we've applied the cool pavement. My understanding is that the cool pavement now covers something like 45 miles of, of, of road in, in Phoenix, which is on the front end of this kind of experiment. What is it made out of? What does it look like? And how much of a temperature difference does it actually make? So it's made with asphalt, water, an emulsifying agent that might be more familiar as some of the components of soap, um, some minerals. Our scientific partners tell us we may be able to see a reduction of 10 to 15 degrees, which will make it the most popular addition to a neighborhood in Phoenix. On the issue of shade, planting trees, what are you doing? What difference would it make? We are trying to tackle the issue of shade from multiple perspectives. We are looking at some of nature's oldest tools to improve shade, such as our tree planting campaign, as well as using modern technology, mapping, integrating shade into buildings and the built environment. We have a citywide goal to increase our shade canopy by more than 10%. We also have a neat, um, database that we're using that really shows us and gives us the ability to track how we are doing. So it's a data-driven program. We have a walk shed mapping tool that we've developed in partnership with our university colleagues that looks at where people walk throughout our community and tries to help us plan 
where we might be able to invest in shaded corridors and really improve that commute to school or to the bus station. What are you looking for when, you, when you're trying to build this tree canopy of shade? We know that there's correlations between tree canopy and income in our community. That means that we have areas where we have higher rates of poverty and they're, they're much less likely to have that lush green canopy. Those are also some of the areas where people are more likely to be using our transit system. So we're trying to put equity at the forefront and really put the canopy where it will make the biggest impact. We're also considering air quality impacts. We know that a good investment in trees can have a tangible impact on both that heat as well as improving local air quality. So we hope to make the city more comfortable for our residents. We have elected to prioritize areas around transit and areas with high level of pedestrian activity. That data-driven approach is incentivizing us and ensuring that we invest in the areas that need it most. Um, it's giving us a result with a, a great equity lens so in areas where we have a lot of individuals who have either one car for a large family or, or no automobiles, those are areas where we can get the biggest bang for our buck for investing in these shaded corridors. So we hope we're becoming a better city that has more equitable outcomes through these important investments. A couple of other interesting things that you're doing as part of this heat readiness. One investing in a big way in solar energy. I mean, it's might as well put it to use, but there are ways to do that um, that also convey shade. <laughs> I've walked under those. Um, and a big push with your electric vehicles. Um, what are you doing and, and how do those help with heat readiness? This is an exciting one for me. My first involvement with the city was as a volunteer on our Environmental Quality Commission, trying to develop a solar energy program for the city. It's now grown to the point where we're number one in terms of U.S. cities for solar installed on our city facilities. We're about to cut the ribbon on our 50th installation. We are doing it strategically, and one that I hope will become a national model is our partnership with our public housing authority. We are putting solar shade canopies over parking at the housing authority. That creates more comfortable shaded areas but it's also giving our residents a $15 credit on the bill. So they're sharing in the benefits of the electricity that is generated at their home community. So you studied environmental science when you were a college student. When and how did you decide, I wanna connect my studies to my work? And how did you make that happen? So I grew up in the beautiful desert Southwest and our open spaces have always inspired me. I also grew up with asthma, and when I was the super lame kid coughing by the track while everyone was out running, it gave you a lot of time to reflect on things like air quality. Uh, working in the environmental field has always been very meaningful to me. You can have tangible results. You help both people and the ecosystems in which we exist. And so I've always loved it from both an intellectual challenge as well as personally meaningful. Helping people have access to clean air and water is so basic and so essential. What then is your advice to students today who look at climate and look at sustainability and say to themselves, I want, I need to do something about this. What should they look for or do to make that leap as you did from student to career where they can have impact? I'd encourage you to be open to non-traditional career paths to having that impact. I have found some of the leaders who are the most effective communicators and most helpful in making policy come from all sorts of different backgrounds. We have people in the faith community who have really pushed us to do more on climate change. We have entrepreneurs who have enabled us to do more. We have both elected officials and city volunteer leaders who are making meaningful contributions to our climate action planning. So it doesn't have to be in the traditional career paths that are most associated with climate change. You can really make a difference from any career path. Having the knowledge and the motivation is what counts. Many thanks to the mayor for her time and for what they're doing in, in Phoenix. And I wanna do a shout out, a special shout out here to our Pillar School partner, Arizona State University. 
and the Julianne Wrigley Global Futures Laboratory there, as well as the Cronkite School. They are working directly with the city of Phoenix. A lot of their research is being applied by the mayor and others. They're also working closely with us uh, because uh, Phoenix is such a fascinating place and ASU is such a dynamic place. We have a number of students and you'll be meeting some of them. In fact, two of them right now <laughs> who live there and are doing this work. So I'd like to invite Adora Shortridge and William Walker to, uh, to the stage. So if you click on your cameras, there's Adora and your microphone, and there's William. Uh, welcome to you both. Uh, you uh, have been working on a research project and you co-authored a story that's posted to planetforward.org entitled, Research Project Looks for Solutions to Protect Children from Extreme Heat. Now, I wanna hear about the story, but Adora, I need to check with you. You got any, I think there's some good things happening in your life. Anything you wanna share with us? Yes, thank you, Frank. I've got some amazing news. Yesterday, I passed my thesis defense and now have my master's degree. Um, so that was a very big accomplishment. And it's and a master's, master's in what? Master's in sustainability. So if anybody is looking for hiring, let me know. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, we'll turn this into a job interview a little later, but for now, let's focus on the story. Uh, yeah, let, me, let me come to you to start with. Uh, you, your story was research project looks for solutions to protect children from extreme heat. What yes. are we doing now uh, and what were you looking at sort of long term to help vulnerable populations? Right. So long term, we are really looking at how we can support schools, meeting them where they are at now. So my project really focused on trying to understand how these communities feel supported in their present time and what it is that they need to become more heat ready, what resources it is that they need to feel like they can better prepare what, for these. What's a, heat, yeah, what's, a, what's a heat ready school? What does that even mean? Yeah, good question. A heat ready school is a school community that has supported and educated staff and has knowledgeable and protected students. And by that, I mean, these are schools that can identify prepare, track, and respond to the negative impacts of heat. Right, William, what about um, vulnerable populations? I think that was part of your interest, both of you, and in the schools that you were looking at too, right? Yeah, of course. We looked at a lot of schools in South Phoenix, or two schools in particular in South Phoenix, and South Phoenix, Arizona is a place that has been burdened by a lot of environmental racism and redlining and a lot of injustices. So this is why Adora was very keen on starting her research there because this is where heat is very exacerbated. And it's very interesting that Adora um, let me work with her and that we examined the impacts of heat on schools and particularly school aged children because there's not much comprehensive research on this. Children aren't always able to thoroughly thermal regulate their bodies and they don't always have the best perception of heat when it comes to sweat and so many other different factors just because they're so young and little. So that's a vulnerable population. Another vulnerable population is communities without access to green space, um, public gardens, different things like that, shade coverage. And also so much of our electricity here in the valley is used for cooling during the summer months. And it's wild how much the utility cost can be for some people. And sometimes it's not always the most affordable. Sometimes a lot of the older homes don't have that infrastructure in lower income areas. So there's just so many people yeah. that are so impacted by this and they're not always given the agency to, to be better. So well, this is definitely part of what you were looking at with your research. And I think it's worth pointing out, you know, at a time when we were, when we've been talking about inequality, um, you know, the same sun beats down on Phoenix, but it doesn't have the same effect in all parts of the city. This is true across cities in this country. Wealthier parts of cities have more tree canopies. They have more cooling. They have more air conditioning. Lower income parts of cities are more exposed and there's often more crowding. I would like to invite somebody else to join us on stage now and my colleague, Lisa Palmer. Uh, she's at the George Washington University School of Media and Public Affairs. She is the National Geographic Visiting Professor of Science Communication. And so as she turns her camera on and waves to us, hello, uh, Professor Palmer. Hello. You have a book and I, you know, I meant to have it here and I was going to wave it around so people will just have to imagine. You, thank you. Okay. <laughs> you bailed me out called Hot Hungry Planet. You've been looking at heat. In fact, you've just written again about this for the uh, uh, Yale Center for Climate Communication. Um, just a quick observation from you uh, on the heat, and then let's go back to Adora and William. Yeah, we know, you know, climate change is occurring, temperatures are getting hotter, those hotter temperatures are affecting, affecting you know, people around us, you know, food and nature in the natural world. You know, I wrote about um, 
climate change and the heat in my book, but also you know, playgrounds. I mean, really, you, you are doing something onto something here with the heat ready schools and the playgrounds, especially in kids. It's, it's really impressive. Lisa, let me let you uh, engage with Adora and William here for a, for a minute or two and uh, see where your expertise steers them, their research and their storytelling. Yeah, and I think that, you know, what's I find really interesting is that you know, you're, you're talking to people who's, um, you know, who are taking action on the ground. They're you know, looking at ways to, you know, to maybe better adapt and change their schools. I, I think that, you know, playgrounds can get really hot, for instance. I think there are guidelines out there now. What are some of the ways that your research can inform those guidelines um, for how we can address the, you know, the hot playgrounds or hot schools? Absolutely. That's a really, really, really great question. And that was brought up by a lot of concerns from the participants themselves. And a lot of schools struggle because the shade sails and the very large uh, overhead structures that provide the most shade are often the most expensive. And for schools of low income areas, this is difficult to afford. So um, offering resources and education about passive cooling strategies, things that are a little bit more accessible and um, can cool individuals and on the playground space to work towards restructuring the playground space to offer more shade. Yeah, and, and William, you know, I think what I found really interesting is in, in kind of um, what you mentioned about children not really mm -hmm. having that ability to regulate the heat, but also like they might touch something and these, this playground and get, equipment can get really hot. I mean, they can, people can get burned by it just from a hot summer day. Um, or even pre-summer day and spring days out, out there. So I guess what are you proposing or I guess what kind of hazards can students kind of try to avoid when they're so young? I guess, how do they do that? I believe that a lot of it is honestly school policy and enforcing different guidelines and regulations to protect our children. So maybe that looks like not going to recess during like a lot of the hotter months. Maybe this looks like ample shade coverage, like in our playgrounds, one of the schools that we looked at, they were actually looking at building a lot of pre-existing, building a lot of infrastructure sh such as shades and canopies to just curtail the heat of the concrete because it is insane how hot it is. So we talked about how we had over 120, we had over 100 days, over 100 last summer. And of course, it's much hotter than that in different areas. So that's not always like the temperature, that's essentially atmospheric temperature. So you can like look at the concrete or maybe you can look at the metal part of the playground. And when we were doing a little bit of field work this summer, Dora, I believe we had temperatures as high as like 140, 160, anything crazy like that. So well, imagine well, 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 how- burn. 140, was it 140 degrees? You were out in 140 degree weather? It was, like essentially the surfaces were like 140 degrees, like the different metal and like the different concrete walls. So kids can maybe go touch it for a couple of seconds and, and have a have a severe burn. Yes. Yeah, the whole temperature we saw was 167 degrees that day. Let me, this, let, let me invite, if I may, let me invite um, our audience. If you have questions, go to the Q&A and put some questions. And if you've got questions for Adora and, and William. And uh, I'm, although I'm going to tee one up. Um, you know, you're both pretty young. You grew up in this place. It's getting more. You're going to stay, or are you? What, is it too hot for you? And you're about ready to bail and go north. Will, do you want to take this one first? Yeah, I'll take this one. So I'm actually from Arizona, and I think that after my undergraduate studies, that I will move elsewhere. But Phoenix will always be part of my home because I love it. And I'm not going to turn into a snowbird. Don't worry about that. <laughs> but yes, this is definitely like a place that I want to care about. And before I leave, I do want to do more research and come up with more tangible things and results. Are you, to are you moving because it's too hot? Am I moving because it's too hot? Yeah. No. 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 I think that there's a lot of adaptation that needs to take place, however, in order for people to be okay here. Adora, are you going to adapt and be okay there? Or are you moving too? I am going to be continuing my time here in Arizona. Um, I am going to be staying outside of Arizona for, or outside of Phoenix for the summer though. It is, it is extremely hot here. Last summer <laughs> really, really kicked me. So I will be here probably part-time. So, so I have a question for, for um, actually for all of you that comes from the audience. Dave White asks a question, how can schools build capacity among their staff 
local parent teacher organizations and communities to address heat impacts? Great question. Great question, Dave. Thank you so much for asking that. This is um, very, very important and exactly what our project really aimed to do. And schools can build capacity through addressing, uh, for they can sign up for school heat alerts um, with the Department of Health Services or through the CDC. They can sign up for, um, or they can go to the Department of Health Services school heat safety toolkit. And also through that, they can become more educated and bring up heat in PTA meetings and during recess, before recess. Sure. Uh, uh, Lisa, have you looked at that? Like what, you know, when, you, when you've done your research on heat, can that be changed by citizen action or not a change, but some strategies addressed by citizen action? Have you seen anything that works? Well, you know, from what I, I find that people are doing is looking for ways to you know, address it through this guideline approach. You know, some of the shading and cooling stations can really help make a big difference in people's lives, especially when there are uh, difficulties in paying the, the energy bill at home. You know, having places to go uh, during part of the day when the heat, it's just the most hot. So having those cooling stations have really been a, a, a greatest help. Okay, um, Will, I'm gonna address, address this question to you. This one comes from Carol Werner. She asks, are you looking, uh, also looking at canopies that are covered with solar cells? What kind of surfaces are you looking at to change schoolyards? And you may be looking at to study it. Obviously, you're not the one who's installing them, but tell us what's going on for that. Yeah, I honestly am open to anything. I like the idea of green infrastructure, so not so much like hardcore canopies and umbrellas, but structures that have, whether it's like desert native plants or some form of vegetation there to have that cooling effect and to essentially build a microclimate. I think that that's something that's very important and countless research from all over has proven that this is very helpful in curtailing heat and bringing down the temperature very low. And that's something that I would like to see here in the Valley take place, whether it's through green roofs, whether it's through like vegetative space on buildings and whatnot because I think that's very special. And by doing that, you're also ensuring ecosystem services and really solving urban heat islands by looking at conservation and looking at communities and their are, engagement. Are, are the schools that, that you were researching doing these things in a big way or not yet? Not yet, because funding, of course, is always a barrier, but I see this as something that is going to be adopted in the future. and something that's very important because people care about it and people have thought about these things. I can say that even at one of the schools we worked at, they may not have had like any vegetative space like on an actual surface, but they did have community gardens and permaculture systems and things like that that they were building that could essentially curtail the heat in the near future. Adora, this one's for you and, and, and maybe you've looked at this in your research. It's a really terrific question. Uh, if you haven't, we'll, we'll move on to something else. But Megan Parker asks, Often regulations limit school staff's ability to protect children. For example, she says teachers can't put on sunscreen or sun hats for legal reasons. Are, are, are legal remedies needed? Did you look at that? What'd you come up with? Uh, great question. Thank you for asking this, Megan. And um, this was brought up a lot in our interviews. I, I personally, I believe that legal remedies are needed. There should be that would probably look more like informal policies or protocols to meet the communities where they're at now um, because of the safety and health regulations and sensitivities that go along there. But this could look a lot more like passive cooling strategies and in the form of education, especially, especially with the families. This really, really leans more heavily in the, the home area, really education at home. Got a couple of people who are asking um, whether and why more people are continue to move to Phoenix. Um, and Bruce Brampton um, says, why? Uh, and should there be economic incentives in place to reduce this and limit residential development? You two are both from Phoenix. What do you know about that? Yeah, I'd say that a lot of people come here for the job opportunities to be here in the Valley because the Sonoran Desert is amazing. It's actually um, the wettest and most biodiverse desert in North America. So there's a lot of opportunities here. And of course we want people to be here and we want to develop, but as we're developing, we want to ensure that we're not having these negative and anthropocentric effects on our environment 
and you know having consequences of that and one of those consequences being at extreme heat which is experienced by the most vulnerable so i'd say that as we continue to develop and more people continue to move here we need to have policies in, pay, in place we need to have infrastructure whether it's like vegetation on surfaces whether it's the cool pavements that kate gallego talked about we need to do things like that it needs to be something that we adapt to because whenever we continue to just mitigate and do little by little on an incremental level, it's just going to hurt us more in the near future. And another thing is that this is a place where we suffer from a lot of our water conservation right. practices. Right. So that's like another thing. And our water is being depleted um, essentially yeah. because of urban heat island of and urban and residential spaces. So this is something that we need to bring back because they essentially dissipate the clouds. Right. So I'd say that by doing all of these things over time and having those measures in place, we can bring that back and then continue to develop on a sustainable level. Your mayor has a, has a big task in front of her. Lisa Palmer, let me just turn it to you and your research and looking at heat and the effect that heat has. Um, is it prompting people to move away? I mean, we've, we've talked about climate refugees. Often that refers to people escaping rising sea levels, but we've got extreme heat in a number of places. Um, and Phoenix obviously is the, the oven in the coal mine. <laughs> You know, I think as for as much as people can adapt and change to it, there you know they will be unwilling to move and, and change their structures because of that. If they're able to adapt, change, if there are some safety nets in place, they'll want to stay there because of all the other you know the, the opportunities that William was talking about. Um, but once those get to be a certain point, once you get at that tipping point where you may not have that safety net, right. where uh, you know it becomes so extreme that right. you're going to be losing your livelihoods, that's when things will shift. Uh, Will, I want to. I want to. I have one last question. I want to do very, very quickly because we, we do need to move on. But it's a really interesting uh, question that Jake Myers asked, um, and I know it's something that you look at and you mentioned already. You've referenced addressing extreme heat. Jake writes presents the opportunity to address extreme inequity. So, how do you frame the story around equity to achieve desirable outcomes? Of course, I think that. We have a very critical time right now where um, we're just now realizing the environmental injustices that are that communities are experiencing on a massive level. So I think that we need to leverage that and turn these moments into movements and really argue that these people deserve, you know, the greatest things in life and that they deserve opportunities for more sustainable systems within their communities because they're the ones most deprived by it. So. I'd say that a lot of the research and practices should take place here, but there should also be like a lot of reciprocity to ensure that these communities are getting the need, the thing, their needs met essentially, and that sustainable systems are left behind. Let me let me take a little swing at Jake's question too. Jake, and to all of you, the one way you frame the, the story around the inequities is to tell the stories of the people who are living those inequities. And, and let them explain and let them show their lives and what they're trying to do, what they're up against, what is inequitable about it. And, and that, those are stories that can be very powerful told in the right way. Okay, before I let you go, uh, congratulations on, on, on having your, your new degree. Uh, Adora, what do you want to do with your career? You want a job? Okay, what do you want to do? I am open to many different things. I have many, many aspirations. So it you depends be, on- You want to be mayor of Phoenix, like, uh, you know. <laughs> I would love to work with, I would love to work in a gra grassroots, small scale, kind of sustainable area. Okay, well, good luck to you. And Will, how about you? What are your aspirations? Well, I'll be graduating in 2022, and then I hope to pursue graduate studies and to do foundation-based work in the future where I can do sustainability projects and work with a lot of collaborators on a massive scale and give the agency to do projects through grants and research. That's, those are my aspirations. What do you think, Professor Palmer? They have some a bright future ahead of, for themselves. And you know, they, I think they're only beginning to scratch the surface of their greatness. So I look forward to seeing what they do in their work. We wish you both the very best and um, success as you move the planet forward. So we'll be watching and cheering you on. Thank you both very much. Really do appreciate your time.